Hey everyone, today's tutorial is basically a piano questions answered session on the subject of piano chords. I've got six questions that various of you guys have asked me over the past few months, and I'm just going to go through them each in turn. If you want to skip between the individual questions, I've marked them all as YouTube chapters in the transport bar down below the video, and they're all described down in the description text underneath the video, where you'll also find a bunch of other useful links. Okay, let's get going. Okay, so our first question comes in from Mr. Jock who says, why is it that when you're playing some chords, you pressed four piano keys with one hand instead of the standard three keys with one hand? Okay, so this is a really useful question if you're just starting out on the piano, if you're just learning about chords. Basically, the short answer is that there isn't a standard, okay? So you can play as many keys as you want when you are playing a chord on the piano, down to a minimum of three, and that's a kind of across both hands. Let's just think about what a chord is. I played a chord of C major there, and the, the, the basic idea of a chord of C major is that it is any combination of the notes C, E, and G on the piano keyboard. And as long as I'm playing some combination of those notes, then it's a chord of C. So that's a chord of C, that's a chord of C, that's a chord of C, I'm going to be well out of shot there. That's a chord of C. Let's bring it up a bit. There we go. All I'm doing there is playing combinations of C, E, and G, and no other notes. As soon as I add a different note, say B flat, then it becomes a completely different chord. It's C7 in that case. So it doesn't matter how many or how few. If I were to only play two notes of the chord, so I just played C and E, then it stops being a C major chord, it starts being a dyad, uh, an, an interval, um, to have its full, what we would call its full identity, it's got to have the three notes. But it doesn't matter how many notes you, you play. You can play four in one hand, you can play three. That's kind of related to the more general question of chord voicing. How, how many notes do you should you play you know how do you know what you know um how to kind of space your chords you know which notes to play in a chord and, and things like that we'll, we'll come on to the subject of learning chords at the end of the tutorial actually with the final question but very very uh basically a really good thing to know a, a good rule that i've talked about in the past if you're choosing which combination of notes to play is space your chords wide at the bottom and tight at the top. And that's to do with the physics of sound, basically. If you think about the notes down here on the piano keyboard, um, if you play any note on the piano or any instrument, it's not just one note, it's a series of notes going up the overtone series, okay, up, up the harmonic series. So you play that note, but you also get a little bit of that one, a little bit of that one, up and up and up the harmonic series. And if you play a note down here, you've got loads of those overtones in the audible range, okay? And so if you play lots of notes all together down the bottom, yeah, they start fighting with each other, the overtones start fighting with each other, and you get that very muddy sound, you know, if you play very low chords. Whereas if you play your chords high up, then there are fewer overtones and it's a much thinner sound, okay? And if you just played your chords high, then it's very thin and can be a bit tinny. So what we tend to do is play a mixture of notes, some of them low, some of them high, but spacing the chord wide at the bottom and tight at the top. I've got a whole separate tutorial on this, which I will link in the description text down below. But that is always a good principle. But just to come back to Mr. Jockerson's uh, question, it doesn't matter whether you're playing three notes or four notes in the right hand. You could only play two notes in the right hand, so you could just play E and G in the right hand. As long as you've got a C down in the left, then, then that's fine. You're still playing a chord of C. Now in question two, we're kind of zooming to the other end of the complexity range and talking about chord identity. The basic question is this, and lots of people have asked me it, why is that chord an F13? Let me give you a little bit of background here. Um, a few years ago, about nearly three years ago now, I posted a YouTube short called, I, I think just called Easy Jazz Piano Improvisation, and it was designed to get people kind of into the zone of practicing their improv if they'd never played any kind of jazz or any kind of improvisation before. And all it was was a simple four bar, four measure chord loop, two measures of that chord, and two measures of this chord, and all you did was kind of improvise o over the top using the notes of a C major scale, I think it was. Thank you. 
I'll, I'll put a link to the um, original short down in the description text. Anyway, loads of people came along, as loads of people always do, and say, hey Bill, what is that chord? And I usually say, in answer to that, that chord is a rootless F13. Um, let me explain my reasoning there. Rootless F13, just remember that. If we think of a full F13 chord, there's a basic F major chord, there's F7, there's F9, there's F11, and there's F13, okay? As you may be aware, if you um, talk about chord extensions like 7th, 9th, 11th, and so on, it's all based on stacking thirds on top of the original chord. So F with a minor third on top becomes F7. If it was a major third, we would have a, a, an MAJ in the chord symbol, F maj. Because there's no major in there, we know that we're basing it all off an F7 chord. So F7, F9, F11, F13. So I'm saying that my chord is a rootless F13 because I'm taking some of the notes of that chord and sticking them together. What I'm actually doing is taking the E flat, the G, the A and the D and smudging them together like that and calling it rootless F13. And um, lots of people were like, oh no, it's not rootless F13, it's like, you know, it, E flat major 7, flat 5, blah, 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 whatever, okay? There are various names you could give this chord, and I'll talk about um, some of the problems of, of chord naming and chord identity in a second, but I called it rootless F13. Rootless because the root isn't there. It's an F chord that doesn't have an F in it. That is actually perfectly standard, a perfectly normal kind of thing to do. Why did I choose an F? Because basically we're in the key of C, yeah? So some sort of F chord would seem to make sense because F is the subdominant chord in the key of C major, which is very approximately what we're in. And it kind of functions, that's the keyboard, it functions like a subdominant chord, yeah? So it, um, it's not a, it, it has that quite, quite, quite kind of bluesy sound that you might associate with, with uh, the F chord in uh, a C major 12 bar blues. Um, and that just seems to me the most logical thing to call it. Now, this is a big problem on YouTube, yeah? Lots of people get quite upset about chord names and say, no, it should be this, it should be that, it should be the other. And as I've said time and time again, I'm gonna say it one more time. It's not gonna It's not gonna be one more time, it's not gonna be the last time I say it, but it really doesn't matter what the chord is called, what matters is how it sounds, okay? That kind of sound is what is important here. Chord symbols are, um, a source of great kind of um, confusion to a lot of people. Chord symbols are not a way of precisely describing every chord that you will ever use. They are not an exact science. They are a system that has been developed by working musicians to kind of communicate with each other or to create reminders for themselves in a way that kind of everyone understands yeah but because it is a, a simplified system a system that's deliberately simple it's kind of a blunt instrument so sometimes you can say you know rootless f13 and if that's all you see in isolation you don't know that it's going to be exactly that it could be another f13 chord you know an f13 chord just with the f taken out at the bottom so it's very um very important not to get hung up on what chords are named. And a lot of people, unfortunately, do get hung up on it. Much more important to think about the sound. And if you really want to spell out, if it's really important to you to spell out exactly what notes are in a chord, then the way to do that is with, with actual musical notation, yeah? Because once you're starting to really specify inversions and notes that are there and notes that are not there, it's just more efficient to uh, to do it on a stave. Question three comes from Killian Wild 2960 who says, hey, I have a question. A minor seventh is a minor chord with a minor third on the top, and a major seventh is a major chord with a major third on the top, right? Right, dead on Killian, absolutely. A major chord plus a minor third on top is a dominant seventh, C7, yeah, absolutely right. But what would be a minor chord with a major third on the top? Also a dominant seventh? Would be happy if somebody could help me out. Well, I'm here to help you out, Killian, because no, that is not a dominant seventh chord. There are various ways of labeling that chord, and most people would label it C minor 
plus major 7 or, or something like that. It's a good example of a situation where the chord symbol system kind of struggles a little bit because it's quite unusual. That is probably what you would you know, call that chord. It's a relatively unusual chord. It does get used um, sometimes. Uh, let, let's think of a, a way, say you're improvising, let's go into the key of C major and you're coming up with some kind of cool cocktail type improvisation. You know, it's quite a nice dominant substitution, actually. So there we've got F minor, major 7, with a G in the bass. And that actually resolves really nicely to a C chord. Yeah, let's try that in a different key. Let's go into E flat. E flat major, the regular um, uh, number 4 chord, the subdominant chord of, the, um, of E flat major is A flat. Let's do a similar kind of thing. Nice big lush. E flat major 7 chord and then go to A flat major 7 and then let's just make that minor yeah really kind of quite quite clashy quite it's got a little bit of bite to it hasn't it yeah put a B flat in the bass to give it a dominant feel and it resolves out really nicely to the tonic chord to E flat with a G at the top there so that's the basic answer to your, to your question Killian you, you would just say it was um, um, a, a flat minor major seven kind of inelegant kind of ugly but it does the job question four comes in from kai uva trispel 238 i'm guessing that's how i pronounce your name it could be k uva trispel uh let me know in the comments anyway hi bill uh, please could you explain the roles of chords in a minor scale or in minor key progressions i like your kind of teaching music theory thank you very much indeed and i'm a great fan of your books and tutorials yeah we'll come back to those in a minute or two anyway okay so let's explain the role of chords in minor scale or minor progressions let's use the key of a minor to do this very briefly let's jump into the major yeah um the relative major of A minor, the major key that shares the same note as A minor is C major. Now, as you may know, we have a basic scale of C major, and we can grow chords out of that scale using a shape called a triad. Okay, so that is a root position triad that we're using right there, and we can grow uh, these chords C, D minor, E minor, F, G, A minor, B diminished, and back to C. And they're what we call the diatonic chords of the key of C major. If you come across a song in the key of C major, most or if not all of the chords in that song will be um, taken from that list of diatonic chords. And different um, chords from that list have different jobs, different functions, as we would, as we would say. So the, the chord um, based on the fifth degree of the scale, G, is what we call the dominant chord, and its main job is to give us a strong pull back to the number one chord, okay? And the, uh, the four chord, the subdominant chord, one, two, three, four, gives us, again, uh, we, it does a few things. It can resolve us back to the one chord, but it also gives us a natural flow up to the five chord, which again takes us back to the one chord. We're getting into basically how chord progressions are stuck together here using those diatonic chords depending on what key you happen to be in. Now, here's a really important thing. You don't have to just stick to the diatonic chords in a progression. Other chords can turn up. You can be in the key of C major, having a progression in the C, and drop in an A flat major chord. Yeah, completely fine, completely normal thing to do. You've got to find your way back to the original key, unless you're on a key change, but, but that is pretty standard. But that A flat major will be what we call non-diatonic in the key of C major. Let's go back to the question. What happens in minor keys? A little bit tricky. Strictly speaking, we shouldn't talk about... Um, we, we can grow chords in the same way, but strictly speaking, we shouldn't talk about them in diatonic and non-diatonic terms, because the diatonic refers to the major scale. That's the diatonic scale of C major. People do it, though. It's kind of lazy. Um, but, you know, we'll talk about the naturally occurring chords in the key of A minor instead, j just to be kind of really precise and a bit kind of geeky about it. Anyway, so... Because A minor is the relative minor of C major and it has exactly the same notes in its scale, in its natural scale, um, it has also has exactly the same chords, but just in a different order. A minor, B diminished, C, D minor, E minor, F, G, and back to A minor at the top of the scale. Okay, so seems pretty straightforward, except one of the problems of the natural minor scale is that it doesn't give us a strong five chord. We don't have a strong dominant chord to resolve us back to the, uh, the one chord if we just stick to the natural minor. And that has led various people over the years to come up with other minor scales, variants of the minor scale, which 
from which we can create other chords. And the most common one is what we call a harmonic minor, or whatever key it happens to be, and we'll do it in A. So there's the basic A natural minor scale. It, it, it gets really confusing because obviously in music we use the word natural to talk about the, a note that isn't flat or sharp, but we also talk about the natural minor scale. So you can have the um, B flat natural minor scale. A little bit confusing. Let's not dig into it here though. So there's our A natural minor scale. Okay, the A harmonic minor scale is exactly the same, but we sharpen the seventh degree. Okay, let's play it without splashing. The bane of piano students everywhere, because learning harmonic minor scales, when you're a kid, especially with small hands, is dead awkward, because you have that big stretch at the top of the scale, yeah, between the, the uh, in, in the case of A minor, the F and the G sharp. But adding that G sharp rather than G gives us lots of new chords that we can use. Let's do the same thing. Let's take our triad and build it up the harmonic minor scale rather than the natural minor scale. And we get A minor, just as first time around, uh, B diminished, same as first time around, C augmented, because now we've got the G sharp, D minor, E major, brilliant. Now we've got a really strong five chord that we can extend to, to E7 and things like that, which will resolve back to the one chord, fantastic. Okay, let's keep going up. Then we've got F major, as in the natural minor. Then we've got G sharp diminished, and then we're back to A minor. So that's basically how, how that scale works. There is another one called the melodic minor scale, which drops in an F sharp on the way up, but not on the way down. Kind of complicated, mostly using classical music. We, we, we won't deal with that here. Now, the difficulty with writing a minor key song is that it's kind of awkward to... Um, rely on just one or other of those scales because if you are just sticking to a natural minor then you, you don't have a strong five chord but if you use exclusively a, a harmonic minor then you've got a lot of kind of quite weird chords in you know like uh, c augmented and you've got two diminished chords you've got b diminished you've got g sharp diminished it all starts sounding kind of edgy so what most songwriters do do, and I'm talking about songwriters specifically here rather than classical composers who, who have their own kind of magical ways of doing things, which again is kind of beyond the scope of this tutorial. But what songwriters tend to do is mostly use the notes of the um, mostly use the chords of the natural minor scale but occasionally borrow one from the harmonics minor scale. So you might have a progression that's entirely using the, um, the chords of the natural minor scale. It might do something like this A minor. C, but then go to E, yeah, to, to give you a good resolve back to the, the A minor chord, the one chord, the home chord, if you like. If you did that just with um, the E minor uh, chord there, to F, yeah, it still sounds kind of all right, but you haven't got that really, that really strong pull back to a minor. So don't get too hung up about the theory because it's a big deep rabbit hole, okay? As always, use your ears, yeah, to, to tell you what works best. But that is the basic principle. If you are just using the chords that built out of the natural minor scale, but then occasionally dropping in a five chord, that's absolutely fine. By the way, if you like my way of doing things, you won't be surprised to learn that I have stuff for sale, okay? Links are all down in the description text below. There's my bundle of classic ebooks, which I've been selling for years and which are hugely popular. I've literally sold thousands of them. Lots of people really love them. That's how to really play the piano, the stuff your teacher never taught you. Seven studies in pop piano and an introduction to cocktail piano. All of those require you to read a little bit of sheet music, but not loads and loads, so check those out. There are my piano packs, each one full of original pieces to learn, exercises, bits and pieces you can do. Also down there you'll find a link to my Patreon page, patreon.com slash billhilton, full of great benefits if you support me on Patreon, plus you get complimentary access to my piano packs and access to my ongoing exercises, inventions and ideas series. So if you want stuff to really get your teeth into, to, do, to kind of develop your skills, do check out my Patreon and my piano packs and my book bundle. If you want to work on your musicianship more generally, then my book, my latest book, How to Be a Better Musician, is also linked down there from bettermusicianbook.com so check out all that stuff if you want to support what I'm doing here if you like my way of teaching I think you will really like it Question number five comes in from Zekaroth 1988 Now, um, Zekaroth 1988 is commenting on a very old tutorial of mine, but one that has been hugely popular over the years, called um, How to Use Four Chords to Play Hundreds of Songs. Um, 
lots of those videos around these days and I think I was the first person to make one of those tutorials not because I'm some kind of genius but because I've been on, on YouTube so long now anyway um, what I did in that tutorial was just take four chords four really common chords I think it was I can't even remember I think it was probably one six five four C G a minor F something like that and those four chords you, you know you, you know those chords you can play thousands of songs and at some point in the video I say look you know you can just change key if you like you can do um, you know play those exact same chords just work them out in the new key and Zekroth says when you say if the key is different you can deduce the chords again from where they were in C I don't really follow how you just know where they kind of are let's just go through the chords let's say it's one five six four um, C G a minor and F in the key of C and that would be F C D minor B flat in the key of F what strange magic is going on that allows me to know what those chords would be in a different key what about if it was in A flat it would be in A flat it would be um, A flat E flat uh, <laughs> F minor and then uh, D flat yeah how, how, how can I just kind of work that out it comes down to the numbering yeah we talked about this a few minutes ago when we were talking about the diatonic chords if we're in the key of C major there's our scale of C major we can number our diatonic chords of the key one two three four five six seven and back to one at the top of the scale so if we know our progression is one five six four notice that i'm using different shapes this comes back to the very very first question as long as it has the notes of the basic chords that's the main thing what i wouldn't ever do is play them like this in their root positions i always you look for positions interlock with each other and maybe even use different bass notes from the chord so it's a g chord but i've got a b which is in the g chord of course in the bass a minor F and that's given me a, a more natural flowing bass line down there something I've talked about quite a lot in the past so you can probably see this coming how do I know what the chords are in a different key well if I know that they're one five six and four in the key of uh, C major the chords are based off the first the fifth the um, sixth and the fourth degrees of the scale so all I need to do is know the chords of the key that I'm shifting to so here's the scale F major um, all the white notes between F and F except the B becomes a B flat and I could build my chords off there F G minor A minor B flat C D minor E diminished back to F at the top of the scale because all I'm doing is running my triad up but using the notes of taken from the scale okay yeah so instead of playing a B I always hit the B flat and I can number them just like I can number the, uh, the, the chords of C. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Back to one at the top of the scale. So all I need to do is find the first, the fifth, the sixth, and the fourth degrees of that scale and the chords built off it. And, and that's how I do it. That's why numbering chords is so useful. It means you can talk about them uh, uh, across keys. So if you've got another kind of progression, say you've got a one, six, four, five progression, really, really common. Again, using loads of songs you can go to any key say you go to E major there's the scale of E major with four sharps in it I can create my diatonic chords from that key one two three four five six uh, seven it doesn't even matter if I don't know what they're called I can just use my knowledge of the scale and uh, my triad shape to create those chords and then what was the progression I used a second ago it was um, one six four five I can go one six four five okay and obviously I wouldn't play them in those shapes but I now know what they are okay yeah just adding a seventh to the B chord there so it basically comes down to knowing the scales and the chords, a great reason to practice your scales, by the way, is to get all this stuff down instinctively. And once you can do that, it actually makes it quite simple to transpose, to use the technical term, a progression from one key to another key. Finally, question six is one that hundreds of people ask me all the time. It's, Bill, how do I learn all the piano chords, all the different chord identities and all the different possible shapes that I can play them in? And the short answer is you don't. Okay, don't put yourself through the process of trying to learn chords 
in a brute force way because it would take forever so you know if you sat down and said there's a chord of C major right how many different ways can I play that in yeah that's a chord of C major that's a chord of C major got a G in the bass that's fine that's a chord of C major that's a chord of C major there are literally thousands of different combinations you could learn so the brute force approach would be soul destroying and you would never do it the way to do it is to make music okay find a bunch of songs that you like uh, with chords um, so either you know printed music that has chords written over the top or find uh, chords on like you know guitar tab sites and things online find stuff for your favorite song just play through it in different ways playing around with the different voicings and inversions you can use seeing how things sound always remembering to listen so many people when they're learning piano don't listen and it, it you know it's the best way of figuring out whether what you're doing is right or wrong and then once you've done it with you know this song that you like try maybe transposing it you know say right i've done that i've played that you know taylor swift song that i really like in c major now i'm going to try it in f major so work out the chords in f major maybe using the methods that we've talked about earlier in the tutorial and you know again try that in lots of different voicings and inversions maybe drop in some extensions like i'm doing there maybe drop in some um some suspensions where you're holding a note from the previous chord into the next one and resolving it to a chord now lots of cool stuff like that you can do and that is the way to learn chords play lots of cool stuff always always listen you might find uh, some post-it notes useful i actually published a tutorial with a method for learning chords using this approach a few years ago and it was based around getting a load of music a load of chords and some post-it notes i'll add a link to that in the description text down below because if you kind of want a systematic way of doing it that is probably your best bet okay so hopefully that has been kind of useful and enjoyable and might have answered a few questions for some of you if you've got any more questions stick them down in the comments below and i will do my best to help while you're down there don't forget to check out the links to all my various products and if you want something else to watch why not check out this tutorial which i think is really useful to piano players at every stage of development i'll see you over there